Today we're going to explore late Republican Rome. And the dates vary according to the historians, but let's take a look at the period from 133 BC to 27 BC. Now, Rome had been winning a series of successful wars. At the end of the Third Punic War, they destroyed Carthage in 146. In the Greek world, they destroyed Corinth after a series of successful interventions in the world of the Greeks. What came next was to a degree of too much success, continual military interventions, the spread of Roman colonies, the imposition of a great system of taxation, and new client kingdoms that led great wealth to Rome more than ever. It also led Rome into a series of crises. Now the Gracchi are two reformers of government, Tiberius and Gaius, and they were both killed for their efforts. They also helped introduce the idea of grain dole that became more and more subsidized by the state and arrived at being free to all male citizens in 58 BC. There were many slaves, more than ever, that flooded the market, also leading to a number of slave revolts. Two of them took place in Sicily, from 135 to 132, 104 to 100. And then there was one even greater in Italy itself, led by the former auxiliary soldier and gladiator Spartacus from 73 to 71. Toward the end of the Republic, it's the generals and their careers that took on a new direction, that they were more and more in a position of power, more often remaining in charge of their soldiers that then developed more loyalty to the general than to the state. We begin with Marius, who held six consulships, and his men fighting for him were known as Marius's mules. It was the first time that Rome really had a professional standing army. Gone forever was the imposition that every citizen had to have a land requirement to be able to participate in the military. Now, under Marius, you could serve in the military for 25 years and get the land when you retired. He fought many successful wars in North Africa and also in Gaul. And when we think of the Kimbrick War, we can look at the remains of the Temple of Juno Sospita in the Forum Holatorium. And when the Social War broke out from 91 to 87, Marius was the lead general fighting against the allies of Italy that were fighting for their own citizenship or their own autonomy from Rome. The next general was Sulla, and he was a former protege of Marius. And he marched on Rome, the first time this ever happened with his army, in 88 BC. And then he went on to win the first Mithridatic War in the Greek East. After he returned to Rome and tried to reform the Constitution, tried to set up a system such that never again could someone march on the city. His attempt ultimately failed. And when we look at what he did to the city, we can look at the tabularium built by one of his generals, Catullus, and he's also credited with rebuilding the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus with columns from the Olympian Zeus temple in Athens, which he sacked in 86 BC. His protege was Pompey, Pompey the Great, who styled himself as a new Alexander the Great. He was an incredible conqueror, winning wars in North Africa, Spain, against pirates, the Third Mithridatic War, and finally, after his fighting in the East, he reorganized what was the Roman East. Now, in the city of Rome, he left his mark by building a magnificent temple complex, the Theater of Pompey, parts of which you can see on the former Urbis plan, and parts of which you can explore today when you explore the area around Campo di Fiori. Pompey was a great general, but he wasn't a stellar statesman, and he formed the triumvirate in 60 with Crassus and Julius Caesar. And it's Julius Caesar that went on 
to outshine him. Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, and then he himself crossed the Rubicon and marched on Rome in 49, and then fought and won a successful civil war against Pompey and those that wanted to protect the Republic, the Republic that was on its way to being broken forever. Julius Caesar, we're talking about the end of the Republic. We conclude pretty much with this one. He's the rival of Pompey. He's the last man standing at the end of the civil wars. And what he decides to do in his reign as dictator perpetuus is to rebuild the city. He's tackling whole regions of the city. He's taking a new approach because he has greater resources than anyone else. And he has the authority invested in himself to conduct those projects. Now, some of his projects don't come to fruition, like building a theater or diverting the Tiber River. But he had a lot of plans, and his heir and successor, Augustus, will pick up on a number of those projects. But one thing he definitely has that we can still admire today is his forum, the Forum of Caesar, which is adjacent to the original Forum for Magnum. He was assassinated on the Ides of March, and although some of the conspirators thought that things would go back to the way it was, Rome was forever changed, the Republic was essentially lost forever, and we can continue that political disruption in the lives of the Romans through the civil war between Mark Antony and Octavian. But that conflict finally ended, and in 27 BC, we have the establishment of something new, the Principate of Augustus. What else can we see preserved archaeologically from late Republican Rome? Well, we can start here with the Aqua Marcia Aqueduct, which is made with the spoils of war after the conquest and destruction of Carthage. We can also come here to Testaccio. We can come here to look at the maybe Navalia, as it's sometimes known, or a warehouse district. And these are walls of a building that dates in Opus Incertum to about 120 to 100 even as late as 80 BC. So it's a very impressive monument for us for Republican and late Republican Roman archeology. span We have the Temple of Portunus, a typical Republican temple well-preserved, a travertine stone and tuff. And this is dating to about 80 BC. And right next to it, we have the oldest marble temple preserved, the Temple of Hercules, made up in Telic marble. This is dating to about 120 BC. And of course, we have plenty of tuff structures as well. Here's a standing Republican portico in the Forum Boarium area, still standing. And finally, along the Tiber Island, we have the remains of travertine stone dating to about 80 BC that actually defined and showed that island to look like a big ship. And joining it here is the Pons Fabricius. It dates to 62 BC. The inscriptions are still visible and the bridge still resists the test of time. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our newsletter for free lectures. And of course, join us for a course in Rome and throughout the empire.